Hello, lovely people. Apologies for the delay. I was trying to get my microphone to work. Um, and, uh, yeah, one second. So... Yeah, so technical issues aside, I'm uh, very happy to be here. Uh, welcome to your weekly Yoga Solutions Live uh, with me, Mark J. Acroviva, on this very sunny Tuesday, the 4th of February, 2020. Um, I hope you're doing wonderfully wherever you are. I hope you're having a lovely time. And, um, yeah, let's get going. So, yes, where am I? Let's see. Let's see what we've got question-wise. Okay. So, I have a question from, from Lena. Um, how to release the hip flexors in what she, uh, she calls it constructive um, relaxation posture or something. Um, uh, I, I, she, she got that term from someone else that uh, sort of practices it. And it's a, it's a simple posture, um, but I, I've got a particular take on it that um, I've kind of, well, uh, come up with my, by myself. It's, it's simply lying down with your feet on the floor. Uh, but the question that she's got is about how to, how to release the hip flexors. Now, um, yeah, okay. Well, the, the, this is the part, uh, oh, let, let's put it into a, into, let's put my other screen on, hang on, it's slightly broader. There we go. Um, it, this is the posture, it's very simple. Um, lying on your back with your feet on the floor, and then people do various things with their arms. Um, I th I'd imagine the constructive relaxation version ha has your arms here or out to the side. Or um, I like to place the hands on the forehead or up in the air. Okay, and it's a it's a position where you just um, you spend time <sighs> relaxing, I suppose. And that, but that, but that's the that's the confusing part for people is because um, the idea of relaxation is usually a passive one. Um, hence, I suppose, the word constructive. Um, I, I've not come across this term before. I, I, I thought I'd sort of come up with this practice in that, in that um, the way you engage with it is, is very precise. Um, and perhaps the way I approach it is different from how other people use the thing. Uh, and it, this goes with my current sort of change of direction, which is around acknowledging the thing that I'm sharing, which is essentially, and I'm getting more familiar with this term, it feel, it feels, I feel more relaxed with it, in virosomatic integration, as in um, a relationship between the, the, rela the uh, let's, start, let's, let's start again. Um, from my yoga, from uh, sourced from my yoga and the application of principles uh, behind my practice, as in the sort of removal of violence, removal of complications, the simplification of of what I'm doing to uh, bring myself closer to the essence of things um, and the various principles that have helped me get there. Um, what it turns out to be, the answer, it seems, uh, especially, and I've noticed this, especially when I'm working with people, is that people's direct experience of, their, of themselves through their bodies is a direct result of their relationships to, what they are d to the world around them. And, and that's pretty obvious, you know. You, you feel, um, the way you feel is based on what's happening to you. <laughs> it's, it's not, that's not complicated. Uh, the difference with yoga is, well, the difference that I have surmised from my yoga practice is that the experience, the, personal, the direct personal experience of the body 
arises, yes, because of what's happening from the outside, but more accurately, it's to do with each individual person's relationship to what is happening on the outside. Um, so that gets closer to the truth. You know, you get two people in the same situation, um, in the same environment, same, same stuff's happening to them. One will enjoy it, another will not. And the only difference between those people will be their histories, um, I don't know, their personalities. The, the difference between them will be the individual's relationship to the thing that's happening. Okay? I think, I think that makes sense. I think it's pretty obvious. When it comes to body work, the experience of the body, um, again, is going to be entirely determined by the person's relationship to their environment. Um, but in this case, the, the, they're doing something with their bodies uh, with an idea of being interested in how the body works. And the, the, their direct experience is going to be a result directly of how they're engaging with their environment. And this is what I've surmised from my yoga practice is um, it's you, you can't work out how to um, well you, maybe you can but um, it's a very long-winded process to work out the correct way to use your body if your reference is information as opposed to direct somatic feedback um, if you're if you're listening to your body then your body will give you clues and uh, this thing that's moving me, moving me towards using the term the aqua viva method is this recognition of the precision of this relationship between what people, the way people respond to their environment, including the earth and the space that they occupy. Um, it's their relationships to those things that determines their experience. And, and you can recalibrate those relationships by changing behavior, by changing the quality of your touch, by changing the, um, the way that you en engage with your environment, the way you occupy space. And when you start changing your relationships to the things that you're engaging with on a physical level, then directly there is a somatic shift, as in your experience of yourself, changes in perfect correlation to the changes you make in relationship to your environment. Um, I think it all sounds pretty obvious to me, but it, it's, a, it's a very, um, if, if you can adhere to um, this understanding of things and keep your attention in these directions of the quality of your actions, the quality of your engagement with everything around you, then you get to directly experience the, um, the transformation that happens in your own felt sense of yourself, <laughs> which for, for 20 years, to me, has felt like the whole point of yoga, to, to be able to practice, to discover the, the true nature of things, and liberate yourself of confusion and misdirection. And um, so that's why I've called it yoga for 20 years. But um, what I've realized recently is that my methodology is not really mentioned in the yoga texts. So my methodology is my own. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm starting to think I, I need to offer, is this, um, yes, this method, this way of um, engaging with the environment around you. And this, this posture that um, uh, Lena calls constructive relaxation, I call it a Mahapranyamasana uh, from my yoga, from yoga, as in the, the great breathing posture. Um, but if you understand it as a means of envirosomatic integration, then you can get a a bit of a clearer idea of what you're doing. So, um, having given you a bit of a spiel there, <laughs> uh, yeah, a bit of, bit of, bit of um, explanation of where I'm heading, let's have a go at this practice. 
Um, the, the arrangement, it's not the only arrangement, I, I have versions, I have variations, but uh, the one we'll, we'll start with will be the feet on the floor, um, and by the way, the fronts of the feet are your feet, uh, your heels are a separate animal, if you like. Um, we can Im we can get them on the floor as well, but I'd like the feet to be on the floor underneath your knees. So if they're too far away, it's a, it's a bit uh, it's a bit tricky to use them. Um, if I'm talking about over there, I don't want you to feel uncomfortably tight in the knees. So there's a there's a way of bringing bringing the feet close that um, uh, doesn't cause any problems. But basically, you want to feel supported by your feet, and then. You can, if you add the heels to that, then hopefully that will make a bit of lightness in the base of the spine, so that the feet being down and the pelvis being down are about equal. Um, most people, when they lie down, they have all the weight on the pelvis, and then they have their legs kind of um, trying to relax towards the feet. The, the thing that's being missed is that there is no actual um, relaxation, because so I was just checking the microphone. Um, there's no actual relaxation because the muscles around their hips are busy holding the weight of the legs. And, um, and that fact is being missed by the person because uh, a lot, most of us um, habitually hold ourselves together around the hips and the groins. And um, it's, uh, that's, that's the question that Lena was getting onto, how to let go of those things. But anyway, um, the point the thing I'm trying to get you to do is, is trying to get a sense of support from your feet and the pelvis that is equal. And it won't be if the feet are too far away from you. So if you bring the feet to the ground and then um, sort of add the touch of the heels with the feet reasonably close to you, then when you return the pelvis to the ground, the base of the spine won't be unduly heavy. And that's the clue, that's the beginning of the clue of what the instruction is. It's to make your contact about equal. Uh, this is just setting the posture up. Um, the, the other thing you might have noticed was I didn't, dis I didn't flatten my back. I, uh, and people, when I say put the pelvis down, mo what people usually do is put their lumbar spines down. They try and tilt the pelvis to flatten the back. And uh, that's... That's not what you're meant to do, I don't think. Um, it's not a, uh, it's a contrivance that we've sort of learnt for some reason in our body work. Uh, that I could go into why, but um, if you can have instead a, a, a sort of neutral pelvis, as in a pelvis that's not tilted this way, nor uh, lifted uh, in the lumbar spine, not, you know, as in sort of held up, if you can arrive in neutral touch and the feet and the pelvis are roughly, uh, are receiving about the same amount of weight, then you'll have a good arrangement between the feet, the lumbar spine and the upper back and there'll be a little curve. There's meant to be, as, as there is meant to be a little curve of the neck. Um, shoulders. Those of you that are used to uh, pulling the shoulders down the back will need to walk your shoulders up cl almost close to the ears so that you can gather the shoulders back away from the space in front of you into the contact with the earth behind you. And if, um, if that feels a, a bit bunched up around the neck, it's, it's not a function of the shoulders. You don't want to pull the shoulders down again. What you want to do is you want to once again, be over your feet and allow the pelvis to be light and then push through a little. So you push um, yourself up through your shoulders. You don't pull your shoulders down. It's, it's an important difference because uh, it will anchor you through the, through the spine as opposed to um, you pulling on the spine from the outside. And then the, the head is making contact and ideally, each point of contact, the feet, the pelvis, the upper back and shoulders, and the head, kind of feel about equal. 
And um, so this is my this is my version of constructive rest. Um, the hands need to be active. The feet need to be active. A really important part because the resting isn't just about uh, trying to stop doing stuff. The the rest, the thing that makes it constructive, is this in this uh, instruction to make your touch equal. And the way you do that will determine the outcome. So this is where enviro-somatic integration begins. It's the quality of your contact. It's your relationship to contact that makes the difference. So um, those of you that um, think of contact with the earth as a passive thing, as a, as a just sort of trying to let go of your weight, will have a fixed experience. Because um, when you let go of your weight, where, where it will be caught will be around certain joints that would collapse, and it, that would be the hips in this position. So for that, uh, and if, if, the, if the hips are tight, if the hip flexors are tight, the psoas muscle is being restricted, um, if you want to anatomize it, I'm not entirely convinced that's the only thing that's going on. Um, and because of that restriction, the breath will be interfered with. You, you don't have a whole body breath. What you have is a person lying on the ground, kind of thinking they're relaxing, and, but there is sort of hovering tension around the base of the spine and the, and the hip flexors. And that's even more true if you flattened your back and tucked your pelvis under. Okay? So, um, this idea of making touch equal. And one thing we can do, just to, because we're talking about hip flexors and how to release them, instead of, have, instead of using the hands uh, to be on your forehead or up in space, you can use your hands to grab hold of the legs so that you can entirely let go of tension around the groins. Now, of course, that will create tension in your hands, but that's okay. Another thing you can do is you add a little bit of away from you pressure from the hands. And the result will be more space between you and your thighs. So th this is a version of the thing that I'm, talk that I'm talking about, my, this practice, this cure-all practice. It's a version that helps you understand how to actually let go of the hip flexors and the psoas muscle. So, um, and the way you use your arms influences that. So if you can just keep hold of your legs so, that the, so you can completely let go of your legs, as in if you took your hands away, the legs would sort of fall. Um, so you're t totally relaxed around the thighs. Make sure you're not resisting with the pelvis. Make sure the pelvis isn't trying to travel with the knees. <coughs> what you're wanting to do is totally allow space between your thigh bones and you by using your arms in this way. And um, <clears throat> things that get in the way would be if you're pushing down from your chest or from your shoulders uh, at the front because that would make the pelvis try and tilt at the other end. So the shoulders rolling and being back whilst you use your hands to send you and your shoulders away from your legs will give you much more of a spacious feeling and a bit of an exaggeration of the extension feeling in the back. It's all good. Um, the thing to do, once again, if you can stay steady with it, is to make your contact about equal, as in the feet. So my hands can push towards the feet, so the feet take a bit more. Um, the base of the spine and the hands creating space away from the legs will help the base of the spine feel a bit lighter. The shoulders and upper back, so I'm not sort of pulling down the front of my body, so that the head can be on the ground 
equally to the feet and the pelvis. As I breathe and as I release. So my first envirosomatic relationship that I'm trying to integrate is with the earth, with my contact, through, through touch. And it's my own touch that creates that balance. It's not um, necessarily the feeling of dead weight. It's not me just waiting for the ground to support me. I'm getting involved directly with all points of contact, hands, feet, um, a little, a little bit about around the base of the spine, but I don't need. I'm, I'm doing this so I don't need to do much around the base of the spine. I'm doing this with my hands, uh, shoulders, upper back, and head. Everything embracing the earth and making it about equal as I breathe and as I release the breath. That's the instruction. And the thing that will happen um, as you engage with that. If you can stay steadily with the intention to make things equal, will be a change in the body. And um, the, the, if you're working with your contact with the earth, the change that will arise over time as you breathe and release the breath within your practice of making things equal, the thing that will change is the uh, internal spaces of the body. So you'll get uh, more spacious along the front, and the hip flexors will release in this particular case. Um, and that spaciousness that you're allowing to develop from the practice of making things equal will begin to give you a sort of relationship to the space around you. Perhaps the space in front of you to start with as, as you open up the front line. Um, but if you can also get a sense of the space either side of you, as you breathe and as you release, have the eyes open with this. Then that relationship to the space that you occupy starts to shift. It's a similar shift. Um, it will change what happens on the inside. Um, if, if, if you can sort of maintain this feeling of openness in the hips, simply from the way you engage through your feet, which is entirely possible, then you don't need to keep your hands there. And the, so the outcome of letting go of the hands is basically you're left with all the space you created. And you can then bring your hands together. The hands have to be active, just like the feet do. And from the shoulders being high and wide on the ground, you can send the hands away from you in space like you're engaging with a surface, like you're engaging to support something with your hands. And this is another part of your relationship to space, is how to engage with it. Uh, it might seem like nonsense in comparison to how you engage with a surface, because the surface is solid. But nonetheless, we have relationship to space, and most pe people are, uh, are busy reaching past their range in order to get somewhere. But if you stay within range and use your relationship to space, as in engage, engage with it as if um, you're carrying weight or something in your hands, through the breath and its release, then things will continue to change on the inside of the body. And, and this is not, I'm not exclusively working my hands in space, I've, I'm, because I have to use the ground behind me to do so. There's not effort in my arms particularly, but they are involved, I'm relating. Um, but there, there is an effort from the earth, and so basically make all things equal, make my touch with the earth equal, and make my touch with the earth equal my relationship to space. So I would use the ground underneath me to meet this space in front of me as I breathe and as I release the breath. Physical actions need to relate to breathing. 
Now, if I stay with that relationship between the earth and space through a full cycle of breath, the thing that changes is the inside of the body. But what happens, instead of, um, well, having created all this space along the front of the body, on the inside of the body, when I start to engage with space, what happens is a kind of gathering around that space that I've created towards the central axis of the body. And this is my third relationship. This is when the somatic part um, of the enviro-somatic relationship starts to, to really shift. Uh, the first part, being with our touch, created internal space. Being with external space create, creates a coming together through the core of the body. And uh, some of you will start to recognize core responses as you breathe and as you release the breath. And uh, for Lena, if you've, if you've forgotten about letting go of space in the groin, then at any time you can um, bring your hands back to the thighs and remind yourself what it feels like to have space in the body, uh, where you're not holding your legs up with your groins. And then when you've found that space, engage with space once again until you get familiar with not uh, holding yourself together at the groins. Other things will be working like crazy. Other things will be working a lot. Um, so it's, it's hardly um, what I would call relaxation, except it's extremely relaxing because what you're doing is you're in integrating the whole of your body and your whole body sense with the earth that you're in touching and the space that you're occupying through the breath and its release. And the outcome is a centering the outcome is, is um, a movement towards your centre, which is, for me, where yoga practice begins. Hmm. But um, it can be any practice, that's the point. Um, that's, that's not the end of my sort of Envaro somatic uh, practices. That's, that's the first three parts that gets you to um, the starting point of being able to practice, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so uh, in, in, in my course terms, it's the first three conditions that we need to meet in order to um, be clear in what we are doing. And um, from then, we can start getting into relationships with ourselves. Uh, most of us, in, in, in all body work, most of us go straight for that direct relationships with ourselves. But it's, it's kind of locked in a feedback loop um, set up by our history and personalities. Whereas this way of applying yourself to relationship to body um, takes you into the reality of your situation, takes you into the reality of your part in your relationship to the space that you occupy and the, 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 and the world that you live in. And it's through, it starts with your hands and feet, so, you know, it's you, it's you relating. And so the, there's a sort of an initial um, step before getting to uh, understanding how to relate to yourself. We get a more, a broader picture of how to relate to the world. Because it's uh, because through that feedback mechanism, the body gives us all the clues we need. When we go direct for relationships to ourselves, it, it's cross-eyed. It, it's confused by history and interpretation. But when we begin with how we relate to Earth contact and the space that we occupy, then there's something more objective, more universal about that relationship that gives us other options and um, we can begin to see ourselves more clearly. So, yes, yeah, so a little, um, I hope that was useful. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful practice, it's really powerful. And uh, it teaches you everything you need to know about yoga, if, you, if you're interested in yoga. It teaches you everything you need to know about, and I, I dare to say this, even though I'm not a, a practitioner, um, I've worked with enough of them to 
be pretty sure that it teaches you everything you need to know about Tai Chi Gong, um, about um, Qi Gong itself, and uh, I think any of these body mind practices, somatic integration practices, um, come under this umbrella of uh, and can and can benefit from this approach. And uh, this is what I've found over the years with the people I work with. It's um, it's it's an umbrella principle that can be applied to your art. It doesn't matter what your art is, as long as you are in the business of um, allowing development, allowing change, and um, wishing to continuously um, process and to allow these changes in your journey. So. Okay, so uh, yeah, I hope that was useful, and I hope that answered your question, Lena. What have I got going on? Uh, <coughs> I'm up in London tomorrow, actually, uh, London Bridge. If uh, I've got a couple of spots free, <coughs> if anyone would like a direct experience of something, you know, a yoga solution of your own, if you've got some some issue with a posture or your, um, some issue with some part of your body, come see me. Um, I, I've I, d I help directly with things, so uh, injury is not, um, un unless <laughs> unless you've just broken a bone or something, uh, injury is not a reason for not coming to see me. It's a very good reason to come and see me. So, uh, you know, sciatica, knee problems, hip problems, anything. Come and see me in London, book a book a session, there's a couple of, couple of spots free. And you can always do that with me online anyway, uh, the rest of the time. Uh, my schedule is public on the website uh, aqua, aquaviva.yoga forward slash one to one two one the numbers okay um, other than that I have coming up let's see I have some workshops uh, one in the nearest one is in end of March at in Twickenham uh, talking of which I will be a regular guest teacher on the next uh, British wheel foundation course in, in Twickenham run by Tuesday McNeil so I'll be there most months sharing my take on the practical philosophies and the posture work uh, and pranayama any, anything you like any, anything that I'm invited to talk about really that, that begins in June in Twickenham so those of you wanting um, to do a British Wheel Foundation that's the one to do if you can other than that, yes, uh, m end of March, I've got a uh, workshop, an open workshop uh, in Twickenham. Heart, uh, you, you contact the Heart Twickenham crew to find out any about this, all of this. Uh, the, the British Wheel thing is on the British Wheel website. Um, uh, oh, yes, online courses, they're running. You can join those at any time and uh, get your free one-to-ones within the course. Uh, Oh, and yes, I'm going to Cyprus. I bought my tickets now. So I am most definitely going to Cyprus the last weekend of May for a long weekend at Soul Space. It's, um, it's a lovely place by all accounts um, near Larnaca in Cyprus. Uh, and yes, uh, the Soul Space team have invited me over to, uh, to teach there. Uh, the lovely Rachel has um, called me in, and uh, yes, it's, so you, you can. You, I think I'm doing three sessions there, uh, or, or uh, yes, I don't. I'm not sure exactly. It's, it's Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, um, but it, I think there might be there's double sessions on the Saturday and Sunday, and a single session on the Monday, and you can book for any of them. Uh, and there's, of course, there's residential options for those of you who want a holiday. I certainly will be having one. I'll, I'm going to turn up a day early and leave a day late so I can. Uh, that's in May. Yes, all right. Uh, that's enough. I can't think of anything else that I want to share with you in terms of what I'm doing. There, there's, there's loads of stuff happening. Um, it's a lot of it's online at the moment, but uh, you can check it out on the website. Just go there, or uh, the calendar pops up when you go on the main page, um, or you can just click on the calendar, on the events calendar, and um, see what's on in your area. 
okay, that'll do. That's me. Lots of love. I'm Mark J. Aquaviva of the Aquaviva, Aquaviva School of Yoga and of the Aquaviva Method, by all accounts. <laughs> Signing off until the same time, same place, next week. Lots of love to you. Bye now.